Tonight we enter the rings. We make a determination to stay here for three months. It's for the monks. And as we make that determination, it's good to stop and think, what do we want to accomplish in the course of these three months? We look at our practice. We look at our behavior in terms of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. We try to have a sense of where our strengths are and where our weaknesses are, and how we can use our strengths in order to compensate for the weaknesses, fill in the blanks, fill in the holes. So the practice is a practice all around. And John, <coughs> John Munn once taught that we should make our practice in the shape of a circle. In other words, in any area where we see that we're lacking, we don't just leave it there. Say, well, that's the way my practice is, or that's something that I'm going to just leave for some time later. We don't know how much time we have left. But we do know we have right now. And if a certain weakness in your practice shows itself, maybe a good time to look into it, see what you can do about it. Because we'll, we'll be living together, it's good to think about the principle of harmony, as the Buddha said. The harmony of the Sangha is what makes the Sangha happy. When the Sangha is in harmony, it creates a sense of joy. That sense of joy then is more and more conducive to getting the mind to settle down with a sense of well-being, getting a good, strong concentration, the kind of concentration where you can stay there in a stable way. And we have to remember that harmony doesn't just happen. Think about an orchestra practicing. You have to work, work, work. To get all the, all the different parts to come together. And it's the same when we're living together. It's so easy to fall into disharmony over little tiny things. A glance. A word here or there. It can cause a lot of damage. It can be really discordant. So it's good to think about the principles that the Buddha taught on how to be harmonious. Some of them come in that sutta on the acrobat. We know the part where the Buddha says that the, each acrobat should look after him or herself through developing the establishings of mindfulness. And that way, by looking after yourself, you look after the other. But there's the other side, too, and unfortunately we don't have the an analogy for that one, where the Buddha says, is by helping to look after others, you strengthen yourself. As you do with others, you try to develop certain qualities. First and foremost is patience, kanti, which can also be translated as endurance. There could be a lot of things that people say, a lot of things that people do, that could very easily set you off. A little bit of irritation. From irritation it grows into dislike. From dislike it grows into anger. And the important thing about endurance is that you don't react. You don't express the anger. You have to ask yourself, who established you to be the National Bureau of Standards? And you don't fall to hell by other people's actions unless you put yourself in hell by allowing unskillful mind states to arise. So whatever you can bear with patience and endurance, try to bear it. That doesn't mean you become totally passive. It means simply that you learn how to be non-reactive. When the mind doesn't react, is not quick to be triggered, then you can see easily what, or more easily, what should be done. What should be done. 
your sense of shame, your sense of compunction can have some time to work. So your response to the situation is an all-around response, looked at from all around, and will lead to good long-term results. Another quality the Buddha mentioned is harmlessness. You don't want to harm anybody. When you do have to be critical, you're trying to find a way to do it in such a way that the person will be willing to listen. We'll take it to heart. It also means that if you're subjected to criticism, learn how to take it not as a sign of somebody's ill will. You take their words and you reflect on them. As the Buddha said, when someone points out your faults, look at it as someone who's pointing out treasure. So you look at what they have to say. And if it really is a genuine fault, well, here's your opportunity to, to overcome the fault, to do something about it. If it turns out what they say is not true, just put it aside. Again, it's one of those things you have to learn how to endure. The Buddha often puts endurance together with another quality, which is goodwill. That no matter what other people do, you have to have goodwill for them. He talks about having goodwill as large as the earth, as cool and as large as the river Ganges. No one can make the earth be without earth. No one can set the river Ganges on fire. Make it like space. People can try to write things in space, but it doesn't stick. You can get a pen and wave it around in space, and the ink doesn't hang there in the air. Because there's nothing for it to stick to. You want to have a mind like that, where people say things and it doesn't reverberate, it doesn't stick. Most of us have a mind like a big sheet of paper. Anybody has a pen anywhere nearby. It's like a magnetic sheet of paper. It pulls the ink out of the, the pen. It becomes an indelible stain. So when that happens, you have to remind yourself, who are you going to blame? You're the one who made your mind like paper. Make your mind like space, where things don't stick. That way it's a lot easier to have goodwill, even when other people are misbehaving, or behaving in ways you don't like. It helps keep a larger perspective. And then finally, the Buddha says, have a mind of sympathy. Sympathy is a little bit different from goodwill. Not only do you have goodwill for others, wish them well, but you actually do things that are good for them. You go out of your way. If everyone were to go out of their way to be helpful to everyone else, life would be a lot easier around here. So look for little ways in which you can be helpful to others. So that our living together is, is not a burden and it's not an obstacle to the practice. So that you find it actually is conducive to helping the mind to settle down and to look at itself. And to be encouraged to keep on practicing. The principle of goodwill also shows up in the Buddha's principles for how to live together in a way that we can stay together for a long time. There are six all together. The first three are goodwill. Goodwill expressed in your physical actions, goodwill expressed in your words, goodwill expressed in your thoughts. The Buddha could have simply said goodwill, but he wants to emphasize the fact he's hammering it in. Goodwill, goodwill, goodwill. Not only in an attitude, but also in what you say and also in what you do. And the other three qualities are sharing what gains you have. In other words, you get something special, you don't keep it for yourself. You think about other people. Again, that's the principle of kindness. Then having right views in common. Not just views in common, right views in common. Everybody works to keep their views in line, is what the Buddha taught. And then precepts. Again, the precepts that are 
appealing to the noble ones. In other words, you really hold to the precepts. If everyone does that, we can learn how to trust one another. If someone says something, you know it's true. If someone does something, you know it's not going to be harmful. That's when we're not holding by the precepts. That's when mistrust develops in the group. And that can eat away at our harmony. It's like someone coming in playing in the wrong key or playing with the wrong instrument. No matter how nice the rest of the music is, it really destroys it. So remember, harmony is something you have to work at. It doesn't just come naturally. They say, well, I'm just minding my own business. Your own business is also to think of the group. As a John Lee used to say, when you live in a monastery, make your eyes as big as the monastery. See where you can help. That principle of sympathy, generosity, goodwill for one another. Be active in trying to make sure the harmony is something that's maintained. Because it's so easy to destroy it. As I said, a glance, a word. It's like you're playing out a key. So actively think of this as something you want to work at. Take some responsibility for it. And if everybody is responsible, then harmony is sure to happen and sure to be maintained. Now, as I said, it's for our benefit. One of those cases where looking after things outside reflects back into the mind. It's going to make a much more conducive environment in which to practice. You go back to your own place to meditate, and you're not carrying any recriminations, you're not carrying any confusion, any mistrust. You go back and you focus straight on what needs to be done inside. It's in this way. Our friendship becomes admirable friendship, one of the factors that is most conducive to finding the noble paths. So think about that. We can help one another here attain something noble. By little acts in the course of the day. So see their importance. Take it to heart. And the three months really will be beneficial. <laughs>